Turn this out for We will recommence the proceedings. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our topic for this session is strategies to harness the potential of European SMEs. This is a very important issue which we are about to debate as it is acknowledged that SMEs are growth drivers in Ireland and across Europe, representing the vast majority of all European enterprises with 21 million firms and 87 million employees. As drivers as of SMEs, entrepreneurs are needed now more than ever and we will also address this issue in this session. I would like to welcome our three speakers for this session, Mr Richard Bruton, TD, Minister for Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation, speaking on harnessing the potential of European SMEs as growth drivers, Ms Joanna Drake, European Commission Deputy SME Envoy and Director of SMEs and Entrepreneurship, speaking on fostering an entrepreneurial Europe and the Entrepreneurship Action Plan, and our third speaker is Ms Trina Campbell, an Irish, an Irish entrepreneur and company director of Be Active Media, who will make a presentation on inspiring entrepreneurs. Can I now call on our first speaker, uh, Richard Bruton, TD, Minister for Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Damien. Uh, first of all, it, it, it is an honour to, to be here and to be able to uh, address you. I, I know that there is a huge amount of assembled wisdom in this uh, room here today, and I think it's really important that we turn our mind to, to the crisis that's facing uh, many SMEs in, in our union and seek to develop best practice as, as we meet those challenges in each in our different countries with our different traditions and environments. Uh, this is a tough time to be an SME in Europe. Uh, I think everyone recognises uh, that. But two-thirds of the jobs that our people work in are provided by small and medium enterprises. So they're absolutely the, the, the backbone of, of our economy. Indeed, you know, if you look at most of these an analyses of where do new jobs come from, they come predominantly from young companies in their first five or six years of, 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 uh, of their lives. That's when they're at their most dynamic, when most jobs are, cr are created. Larger companies are in a different space. They don't send, tend to be so job rich. So focusing in on the needs of entrepreneurship and of small business is absolutely crucial for our, our, our long-term success. I suppose Ireland, for that reason, has set as our core theme, stability, jobs and growth. That's the theme of the, of, of the presidency. Of course, against a, a background of you know, very deep recession in Europe, a lot of fiscal consolidation, you know, creating that growth requires a lot of ingenuity, uh, not least in countries like ourselves who are adjusting countries, who have particular problems on the public finances uh, front. So I think the sort of things that, that we have been seeking to look at are areas of, you know, where are the areas of opportunity? And you know, the first one, I suppose, is trade. You know, undoubtedly, we are a trading, a, a trading continent. 90% of the growth uh, in trading opportunities over the coming years are going to come outside of the European Union. So one of the pillars that we've been seeking to pursue, which is as important to small enterprise as, as to, to global enterprise, is exploiting the potential of free trade agreements with other uh, countries or nations. And that's recently we have had an informal here 
trying to prepare the ground for opening a trade agreement, a free trade agreement with the, the US. I think there is great potential in these free trade agreements. Uh, Europe-wide, the Commission has estimated that all of the trade agreements that are currently in play, if you like, could generate two million jobs in the European Union. So that is a source of growth that's not to be, uh, to be sneered at. But obviously, the capacity to internationalize our SMEs is a particular challenge within that. The data show that only 13% of SMEs export beyond the European Union, and that is a huge challenge. So that there, there is this opening up of opportunity well beyond the, the shores of the European Union. We need to position our companies to, to exploit that. And that's one of the issues that we'll be de debating at our informal ne next week. Another area of opportunity is very clearly in the whole access to finance that you know, a lot of a small and medium enterprise has run into very deep problems in access to finance. Those problems again are greatest in the adjustment countries but not confined to the adjustment countries. Countries like the Netherlands have problems for their SMEs gaining access uh, to finance. So again, I think we need to be much more innovative. Um, Ireland, I suppose, like a lot of Europe, uh, doesn't have quite the same structure of uh, seed and venture capital as would prevail in the US. Uh, we have tried in recent years to, uh, to, to develop that, partly with state support. And between state support, uh, at the moment, we have in Irish terms, it's not an insignificant amount, two and a half billions worth of funds, which are joint venture between the state and private providers in the business of providing uh, to SMEs. And I think there is this challenge, as the banks have become more risk averse, as they have in most of our countries, do we need to look at non-bank finance sources? Uh, and again, that's an issue that's been very intensely debated. I know some countries have already moved to have uh, either non-bank sources, uh, are new banks being introduced? I know that in the UK they're looking at this, in other countries like France they have developed that. You, so there's a very lively debate as to whether the traditional bank, as, as we know it, are able to fill, uh, to fill that gap. COSME, which is obviously a very important uh, program that we're trying to develop in conjunction with the Parliament at the moment, uh, with the European Parliament, that signals the opportunity for new innovations in access to finance, both equity funding and, and, and others. Similarly, the, the extra 10 billion to the EIB in, in capital is targeting at this, uh, at this access to finance. But it is a huge problem right across the, the Union and we are you know, very conscious of, of needing to develop responses. I suppose the other key issue for SMEs generally is if you look at uh, our investment in R&D as a, a union, we uh, 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 invest I think about one third of global investment in a lot of new technologies, key, key KETs as they call them, key enabling technologies, but about only one sixth of the commercialization of those key enabling technologies occurs in Europe. So we're, we have a lot of the ideas, if you like, and the people developing the ideas, but we don't seem to be able to uh, quite make the, 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 the transition to commercializing them. I think that's a perennial challenge, and I know that uh, it will shape Horizon 2020. There will be much more participation in Horizon 2020 for, for SMEs. Uh, and I think here in Ireland, as I'm sure elsewhere in Europe, as we fund research, we're building into all those funding contracts the requirement to be much more commercially relevant, to be able to attract funding. Obviously, the other big element of, of how do you create growth in a constrained uh, environment is to complete the single market. Uh, and I know that the completion of the digital market and the completion of, this, of the services market between them is estimated to be about 6.5% of GDP, additional GDP, European GDP, could be created if we, if we completed that. So if you add up the free trade agreements, the digital and the single market, you have... A, you know, at our disposal, 10% of GDP as a potential if we can drive those opportunities successfully. So clearly our presidency has been very preoccupied with driving forward individual files. Each one of those, I suppose, are small, like professional qualifications or digital signatures or whatever. But in their, in their entirety, they start to open up a, a very fruitful uh, market. 
I, I think that's, that, that's the, the, the journey that I think we have to, to travel. In Ireland, what we are challenged with is we built a, uh, an economy on a false foundation. It was built on construction, on a property boom, and on debt. And we have to recreate an economy built on enterprise, on innovation, and on exporting. That's a journey that we're trying to make at, at a, an accelerated pace as best we can. We are having some successes. It's the same journey that's happening in most of Europe. The same journey has to be travelled. So I think this is a time for shared experiences, and I hope that uh, by bringing together Together, you know, experienced parliamentarians uh, and officials across Europe that we can start to, to look at what works and what doesn't work and perhaps share those lessons uh, among, among uh, our, our, our legislative frameworks uh, so that we can provide a better environment for SMEs. So I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. Happy to hear comments and take questions if, if there are some later. I can shed light on what we're trying to do in advancing individual files are what we're doing uh, in, in Ireland in terms of the challenges for SMEs. Thanks very much indeed. Yeah, thank you, Minister Bruton. Uh, can I now call on our second speaker, Ms Joanna Drake. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, morning, delegates, uh, chairs, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we've had a lot this morning, and I was really happy to assist with that debate about youth unemployment. Of course, this is, I think, the biggest headache in so far as uh, the European perspective is concerned, as we owe uh, hope to youth, uh, as we owe them faith uh, in them being uh, able to integrate themselves in the job market. However, we, we also have another structural problem in Europe, and this is what I'd like to concentrate on today. We are lacking entrepreneurs. We are lacking the entrepreneurial spirit. The preference for Europeans for self-employment is at an all-time low since 2001. We have, as European Commission, we started to survey entrepreneurial mindsets in Europe since then. And in just 12 months, this was, the figure was 45% for Europe, aged for people aged between 19 and 25. Their preference for a salaried job vis-a-vis -vis being an entrepreneur went down to 37% in just 12 months. You compare this figure to the figures in the US, in Brazil, US is 51%, Brazil is 63%, China is 71%. I think it just goes to show, these figures goes to show that we're lagging behind in main, with our main competitors in terms of entrepreneurial spirit. Why do I mention this in an employment context? Are we Europeans telling people, well, if we don't have jobs for you, become self-employed? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with being self-employed. Actually, it's quite good. It's very positive. I think we need to tweak that as well in the European culture. But I'm saying this mostly in the context of having entrepreneurs, SMEs, creating, even in time of crisis, 85% of all new jobs in Europe. More than 4 million new jobs are created by newly founded businesses. Europe has a vested interest to make sure that it continues to generate new entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs who are young, entrepreneurs who are talented, entrepreneurs who are not scared of taking risks. But we need to do more for them in terms of reigniting that spirit, reigniting that mindset, not being scared of taking the risk, not being scared of failing and starting again. But we also have to help them by having the right structural framework conditions. How are we going to do that? We need, Minister Bruton just said, we need more jobs, we need more innovation, we need more competitiveness. But it does take a lot of personal risk and effort to transform an idea into an entity. Minister Bruton spoke about the millions of ideas we have which fail to commercialise, to be commercialised. Given the economic crisis and uncertainty, entrepreneurs nevertheless dare to venture out. They are really the heroes of our times. They deserve all our support. And this is why the Commission 
has thought it wise, together with a lot of support from other services in the Commission itself. It was not just DG Enterprise Dream, but it was also all the services of the Commission really wanting to uh, participate in this. And we launched the Entrepreneurship Action Plan, Entrepreneurship 2020 Action Plan, adopted only in January of this year. We are urging you as well to push it, to encourage its implementation by the Member States. The plan not only aims at creating an environment in which entrepreneurs can flourish and grow, but it goes further. It aims to change and reignite the culture of entrepreneurship in Europe in the long term and make Europe one of the most entrepreneurial areas in the world. We are talking about changing of culture, changing of mindset of citizens. This is basic and it's intrinsic for the installation of willingness of our initiative or entrepreneur. We need to build entrepreneurial know-how, skills, capabilities and attitudes among our citizens. The action plan is a blueprint for decisive action to unleash Europe's entrepreneurial potential and a key supporting pillar of the Europe 2020 strategy and the industrial policy communication mentioned also this morning by Commissioner Andor. Can Europe really do without the potential of 14 million young people? Can Europe do without the entrepreneurial potential of women, immigrants, seniors, the unemployed, long-term unemployed? All of them have entrepreneurial potential. We need to draw it out. We need to have an environment which is welcoming for them. The entrepreneurship plan is based on three pillars. Entrepreneurship education and training, the need to support growth and business creation to give our youth the training of entrepreneurial knowledge and skills and to educate the future generations of entrepreneurs. The environment, secondly, where an entrepreneurs can flourish and grow. I'm talking here about the public administration helping entrepreneurs, or if it cannot help them, at least get out of their way. Thirdly, role models, reaching out to specific groups whose entrepreneurial potential is not being tapped to its fullest extent, or who are not reached by traditional outreach for business. I mean, as I said, in particular, women, young people, immigrants, senior citizens, the long-term unemployed. We need to invest more in entrepreneurship education, the public perception of entrepreneurs, and in, and in support to groups that are underrepresented amongst entrepreneurs. Let me say something about women in particular. In Europe, women constitute 52% of the total population, but only one-third are entrepreneurs. It is clear that we cannot afford having such a potential partly unexploited. To support women's entrepreneurship, in addition to other successful initiatives already launched, the Commission will establish a European online platform whose functions will be education, mentoring, advice and business networking. All these challenges must be met by concerted joint action of both the European Commission and the Member States' national and regional administrations to have a desired deep and long-term impact. I invite you, therefore, to have a good look at the action plan and to have a good look at the suggestions made for Member States therein. Part of any strategy to foster an entrepreneurial culture should be a change in the way entrepreneurs are perceived through practical and positive communication about their achievements and their value to society. Young people should be encouraged to see successful entrepreneurs as role models. They should envision entrepreneurship as an attractive and realistic career option and be equipped with the necessary skills and knowledge. We need to invest in entrepreneurship education. This is one of the highest return investments Europe can ever make. Some surveys conducted on students running a mini company in secondary schools show that between 15 and 20% of participants will at one point start their own company. This figure is much higher for entrepreneurship education alumni than for the general uh, population. But the outcome of entrepreneurship education is not limited to increasing the number of successful entrepreneurs. Teaching entrepreneurship is about shaping entrepreneur, enterprising individuals. Today and in the future, the ability to get new ideas, to put these ideas into action, will be the most important. 
This is, there is growing evidence that the acquisition of entrepreneurial attitudes and skills enhances the employability of young people, giving companies the possibility to find employees with characteristics that are much in demand today. Proactivity, flexibility, autonomy, the capacity to manage a project, a project effectively. According to the results of a study published by the Commission last year, 78% of young people who were engaged in entrepreneurial activities at university and 66% of those who were following a course in entrepreneurship started the first period of employment directly after graduation against 59% of a control group. There are excellent programs in Europe that promote entrepreneurial learning in schools and universities. What we need to do is to make this type of learning a basic feature in our education systems. This is why the Entrepreneurship Action Plan calls for member states to embed the key competence of entrepreneurship into school curricula before the end of 2015. This is, of course, an ambition goal. The objective is to reinforce cooperation between member states and encourage peer learning, but also to make guidelines available for universities and schools that aim to become entrepreneurial through self-assessment tools that are currently being developed. I want to stress that education for entrepreneurship is not necessarily a specific subject or topic. It is a way of teaching, of presenting a subject, it's based on project work and on the possibility for students to express their initiative and their creativity. We need to transform our schools and universities into places where creativity and innovation are actively encouraged, but not just stopping there, but also going to the next step of having the skills to commercialize an activity. Of course, there are other key aspects that the Entrepreneurship Action Plan also addresses. I'm talking about access to finance, transfer of business, reducing administrative burden for SMEs, giving a second chance to honest, failed entrepreneurs. I will just mention a few examples because I'd like to conclude. As a full list of actions, of course, is uh, too long to mention. On finance, for instance, besides strengthening its existing financial instruments, the Commission also proposes to create a European market for microfinance and to simplify tax structures to allow SMEs to raise funds via direct private investments such as mini bonds, crowdfunding and angel investments. Easier transfers of business ownership every year. Approximately 450,000 firms with 2 million employees are transferred to newcomers, to new owners across Europe. Yet it can be so difficult to make a transfer that an estimated 150,000 companies with 600,000 jobs may be, may be lost each year. The Commission proposes to expand the markets for enterprises and remove barriers to cross-border business transfers. Bankruptcies, by far the most majority of bankruptcies, 96% to be precise, are due to a string of late payments or other practical problems that a company faces. Yet the second starters are usually more successful than beginners in companies. The Commission will be working intensively with Member States to significantly, significantly reduce the length and costs of insolvency procedures in Europe and facilitate second starts of honest bankrupts. All this is, of course, very important, but it is only by winning the hearts and minds of our young people to the prospect of an entrepreneurial career and by giving them appropriate skills and knowledge that we will succeed in the long term. This is why I focus my intervention especially on young people and education. The action plan and its key actions will be followed up by the Commission through the Competitiveness and Small Business Act governance mechanisms, namely the National SME Envoy Network, who together with the Commission uh, Envoy, SME Envoy, um, report back uh, quarterly at least uh, on the progress made, including on the action plan. Um, we will ensure progress on this plan as we go along. Member States will be invited to report on the progress on uh, the, key, uh, the key tenets of this plan at the national level in the context of the national reform programmes and the framework of the European Semester 2. This is a task for all levels of governance and for all key actors of our societies. By working together with passion and with a common goal, we will be able to come out of this crisis and concentrate not on austerity, but bringing in jobs 
via more entrepreneurship. I think by building more the foundations of a reignited entrepreneurial Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Drake. Um, can I now call on our third speaker, Ms. Uh, Trina Campbell, who is a major success, success story for Ireland. Over to Trina. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ministers, distinguished guests. It's a real pleasure to be here. I have 10 minutes, and in those 10 minutes, if you were only going to take one sentence from the 10 minutes talk that I have, it really would be, please think differently. I think the definition of insanity, as we all know, is trying to do the same thing over and over again and getting a different result. In order to succeed in business today on a European and a local level, I think that we need to think differently and think differently and more creatively around the business models that currently exist. Um, so who am I? Uh, well, I'm an entrepreneur. I run a transmedia company, which means we produce digital content across all platforms. I'm an EU ambassador for the European Network of Female Entrepreneurs and Ambassadors, and I'm a co-founder of the Active International. We're a small company, we're based in Ireland, but also have offices in Portugal, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, and in London. And when we first started off, people thought we were insane 10 years ago. The dot-com bubble had burst. Why would anyone want to engage with new technology and new ways of reaching people for that place? And the economy was in a pretty bad state. But we had a passion and an idea, and we thought, let's just go with it and see where it takes us. And so I'm introducing you to our story and the lessons that we learned along the way in the hope that some of them may be useful for you in deciding where European SMEs should be going. So that's 30 seconds of us. Uh, so when we started off um, in the European business sector that we work in, it didn't really make sense in terms of a business model to me as a business person going in. European film and television is very expensive to make, and it's one of those industries where people have to put a lot of money up front, and there's no real prototyping. So you're spending anywhere from a couple of hundred thousand to a couple of million on a concept which you really don't really know if the audience is going to grab a hold of. And you're in increasing competition from U.S. studios who have large resources and lots of money. So we decided that for in, our, in terms of our business model and how we would think differently about that problem is that we would put our audience front and center in terms of the, the products that we were developing. So whereas whereas the issues that they have in terms of new technology and in terms of small, small percentage of European products, as we know, get, are distributed across Europe in terms of films. It's very rare that you see, you know, that you don't have a US blockbuster in your cinema or your local cinema pla cineplex on the weekend. It is predominantly, you know, a US import-driven economy in that sense. And in order to make a dent in it, how would we as a small company make that dent? And the dent that we decided to make was to develop directly in conjunction with the audience, using social media, new technology, new platforms. Why develop something in isolation when you can develop it online and ask the intended audience for your product to give you the feedback straight away, to be the people who tell you if your characters work, if they don't work, if they like them, if they love them, if they hate them, to go and build community and experience around the things that you're trying to develop. And what we found through releasing our projects in terms of even starting small and online with ebooks is that if we were getting two and a half, three million views of an ebook, then we knew that we had an audience out there that would potentially follow the television series, the web series, download the game, buy the album, go buy a cinema ticket to go and see it in movie theaters. And that's what made our business model different from the others that were around us. So our achievements so far, we, we, we've, we've been lucky. I mean, we were the first internet series to cross to television in the UK. 
We were the first drama series on Pinterest with Beat Girl, and we were named eighth most influential profile on that social networking site. Uh, Barack Obama was number nine. I'm not really sure how we beat him, but seemingly we did. Um, our productions are sold in four different continents, 30 territories. We've sold maybe three and a half million books, movies, video games, digital downloads. We're the first Western format to go into China and be reversioned for the Chinese market with Sony Pictures and Television. And we were the first Irish company to sell a scripted drama format into the US earlier this year. So we're achieving success with the business model that we started to pioneer. But the reason we started to pioneer it is because everybody else was so intent on doing the same thing. And I think that's what entrepreneurs do and what they bring to an economy is they learn to think creatively and differently around the problems they are trying to solve. And again, if you're going to take anything away from this, it is the need to think differently and creatively about the problems we're attempting to solve now. So our two cents for entrepreneurs who are starting today is that there is a real need to focus on the consumer, the, per the audience, the community that you are trying to build up, and less on the third middle parties in distribution. Um, also, in terms of, of implementing your business plan, use all of the resources that you have available to you. We were really lucky in terms of Enterprise Ireland were very beneficial to us when we were starting up. And it's not always about the money. The money is great. It is definitely something that helps. But it's also about the mentoring, the advice, the support, the ability to tap into learnings from people who have failed, who have succeeded, and actually use those in implementing your own business plan. Entrepreneurs need support, and it is, it's okay to fail. It's not okay not to try, but it is okay to fail, to pick yourself up off the ground, learn from those failings, and move on. I think it's one of the things that we don't tap into enough, is that people who have businesses that haven't succeeded, they know the reasons why they haven't succeeded. They are able to give that information to the people who are following behind them. Technology. Technology will change faster than you can legislate for it, but it is one of the things that is really changing the industry, not just ours, but across all of Europe. When we use digital platforms and social medias to contact our audience, we're doing something that would never have been possible 10, 15 years ago. All digital workflows enable us to keep costs low. In terms of the technology for distribution on a global scale, ebooks, digital downloads, videos, downloads, games, Last week, our, we had one of the songs from a movie we were releasing in Ireland in two weeks' time was trending on Twitter in Canada. We would never have had that reach 10 years ago. Technology in terms is, is making us a global marketplace where we can all interact on a global level. And it's changing what's happening with SMEs too. It used to be that you needed a storefront and you needed money to go and put up rent, open a shop front down the road. Now you can have an online store with very little of money behind it and be able to start selling your product directly to your consumers. Key for these people in terms of getting them to those positions is advice, mentoring, and information about how to set up and how to start up and how technology can be useful in terms of implementing their dream. Our belief, and I think it's the same belief that everybody else has here, is that entrepreneurs will be leading the change in European business and that they are basically the backbone in terms of our, our society and our economy. Niche business is now in a position where it can grow in a much faster and quicker way than it had in the past. We're in a consumer-driven market and service in, in terms of the service you provide to the consumer is becoming key in all buying decisions. Consumers are very savvy now. They don't want to go with just ad banners online. They want to have, feel the sense of community, of being able to interact directly with the person who's selling them the product. We also believe, uh, and this is something that comes from us ourselves, that entrepreneurs do not grow in a vacuum. There's a real importance in having creative clusters and competition is something that pushes us to do even better in our daily businesses. We also believe that business is give and take, and in our particular case, we really wanted to give something back. Um, I think when Google was founded, it was founded on the motto of do no harm. I think a lot of technology companies would agree with that, but I don't think that's enough anymore. I think you have to do some good while you're at it. So what we wanted to do in terms of our company and using our own internal resources, well, we started to build a business channel that would be available online on YouTube for the next generation of entrepreneurs who are coming up behind us, just offering them simple, unbiased advice on a platform that they know in a way that they can access it with little 30, 40, three-minute segments in terms of advice from industries, not just our own, but across all sectors. And on that note, and in order to hopefully inspire you about the different sectors that are out there, I'm going to leave you with a clip of that.
if anyone has time later and feels like browsing on YouTube, I recommend it has interesting stories from a lot of different case studies and a lot of different sectors. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Trina, thanks for that. Thanks for your, your, your own story and your own comments. And certainly you've had focus on minds here uh, and to help us get into the head of an entrepreneur. So certainly your, your, your model might work very well for a lot of us politicians as well to consult the people before we actually put a policy in front of them um, and get good, good, good advice back from them. We do try it, but I think you've, you've mastered the model, so we might, uh, might copy that. Um, just now we're, we're going to take questions from the floor. And I'll ask the speakers if possible to try to keep to two minutes. And when I say possible, we have no choice but to keep to two minutes because we are short in time. So our first speaker is is uh, Ms. Garten said from Denmark. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking our hosts for a very interesting program and for including this extremely important topic in today's agenda. I believe that we must first and foremost realize that SMEs are a key factor in creating jobs and growth. In fact, during recent decades, small businesses have created a large share of all new job opportunities. At the same time, it is vital that we face the fact that we are up against a crisis that will not just go away by itself. So we must create an environment across Europe which favors entrepreneurship and which restores faith in the future among entrepreneurs. Not least, we must inspire and restore the faith of the young generation, which has been unfairly punished by this crisis. I would therefore like to contribute to discussion with three ideas, which I hope will help to provide inspiration and confidence in the future for our young entrepreneurs. Firstly, I believe we should ensure that our educational systems provide a sound basis for a career as entrepreneur. This should be done as a partnership between experienced entrepreneurs in the private sectors and the universities. Secondly, we should ensure that funding and financial incentives are in place, making it possible not just to start up, but also to maintain new businesses. And thirdly, we should find ways to make legislation simpler and smarter so that entrepreneurs can focus on being innovative instead of fighting bureaucracy. You cannot innovate if you are fighting red tape at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. This is perfect on time. Our next speaker is from the Netherlands, uh, Mr. Mark Verhaeyen. Thank you very much and thank you for the contributions. I think we all agree upon the importance of entrepreneurship uh, for the future and the strength of Europe. Small and medium-sized companies are responsibly not only for, responsible not only for the most jobs but also for, for very original and promising innovations. And in the end, it are not the governments but it's the companies who create jobs in Europe. And how can we promote entrepreneurship in Europe, especially amongst young people? That's the question, I think. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Minister Bruton, for his remarks on uh, finishing the internal market, the ability of SMEs to participate in export and the access to capital. Um, and as a starting or growing company, you need access to capital. We all agree on, on that. And what role do you think, besides the member states, can the EU or especially the European Investment Bank play in this aspect? And the second question uh, is about deregulation and bureaucracy. Um, less regulation, better regulation, less complex regulations is what we need, I think. And a question to Ms. Drake from the European Commission. Um, can the Commission play a more active role in that challenge? And what role does the uh, Stoiber Group of the Commission of Edmund Stoiber play in uh, this problem? Is it still active and does it really contribute to less or less complex regulation at the moment? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted that SME entrepreneurship has a particular focus in this conference. 
SMEs are the backbone to any successful economy and generate a lot of jobs as well. Their value is not always fully appreciated, somewhat underestimated. So I think there are some framework conditions that are essential for SME entrepreneurship. In Europe and elsewhere in the world, in order to be competitive, Oftentimes, you can have 30% market share, and a 30% market share can lead to concentrations. We've heard that our universities are doing excellent work in basic research, but sometimes they don't always translate those excellent ideas into products. Oftentimes, this is taken up by international companies. They work on the ideas, develop them further, but oftentimes those products aren't manufactured in Europe. And that's a worrying development. If we had better competition law, I think that situation could be remedied and would be helpful for SMEs. In order to promote the competitiveness of SMEs, I don't think we should overburden those SMEs with social costs that uh, can impact on their ability to develop and market their products, can also threaten their very existence if they have too high administrative costs to bear. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more question before we return to our panel. Uh, our four speakers from Turkey, uh, Mr. Ali Erkosan. Thank you. I think we must talk about not only the European Union, we must talk about the EU and the neighbours like Mediterranean countries, uh, the Middle East and especially Turkey. I think the mobility is very important for the SMEs, mobility for business, for mobility for education, mobility for social and cultural events. At this point, Visa procedures have become an important burden for those who wish to do business with the SMEs from outside of the EU. I think I am only the one deputy who must take visa to come here. Because I am from Turkey, I think it's not acceptable. So improving the conditions on this issue would increase contacts and business. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I'll take it. We'll go back to our panel now and we'll start, start with Ms. Uh, Joanna Drake, first of all. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, very direct question regarding the administrative burden. What is the Commission doing? Is the Stoiber Group still alive, etc.? First of all, um, our main philosophy um, for SMEs is think small first. This is put into practice on a daily basis in the European Commission, in the EU's decision-making process. Think small first is a way of how the impact for SMEs is first measured uh, before a proposal is actually adopted at college level. But apart from that, not only is it measured, but we have mitigating measures put into place if possible and as far as possible. Just recently, you might have heard about the top 10 most burdensome pieces of legislation exercise, where basically companies were asked, and we had quite a lot of um, feedback. Um, I think it was more than um, 10,000 companies who responded to the survey, um, where we asked um, the companies to pinpoint the top 10 most burdensome pieces of legislation. The results are online, and you will see that uh, most businesses uh, pinpointed uh, directives like the REACH directive, the uh, uh, safety 
uh, product safety directives, taxation, etc., uh, as being the most hated ones for administration. Um, the follow-up to this is uh, being undertaken presently with the various DGs uh, who are responsible. We are doing this also with the help of the Stoiber Group, who is giving uh, regular support um, to this sort of measure, and who is also involved in what is called the refit exercise, uh, it, uh, by which, which is being coordinated by the Secretary General of the Commission, uh, by way of giving a very visible and strong message that the Commission is very serious about looking at this legislation, taking a structured look at legislation, critical look, and actually refitting it for today's and tomorrow's, tomorrow's needs. However, I still want to emphasize that the most important is what is done actually before a, a proposal is undertaken, and that is the Think Small First principle, with whom, by the way, we also work with the SME envoys, with the net network of SME envoys, um, who together with us also ensure that this happens at the national level, of course, and the uh, methodology and uh, the modality that best suits their territory. Another um, word about um, the finances. Uh, a question was asked about you know, how the European Union can help uh, in finances uh, for, for SMEs. I agree that this is, I would say, not, not the number one headache, because you know, so our surveys show the number one headache is actually um, access to skills uh, for SMEs. Uh, number two would be access to finance. But the European Union does already support uh, entrepreneurs and businesses with a wide range um, of EU programs, providing loans, guarantees, venture capital, and other equity financing. Um, these are managed by financial uh, intermediaries such as the banks, venture capital funds, and also for either financial institutions at the national level. Uh, this has been the record so far until the end of this year when the current um, budget will expire. The next budget, 2014 to 2020, which is still being discussed between the European Parliament and the Council, also envisages, as Minister Bruton mentioned earlier, uh, another set of uh, financial packages which are also uh, being um, targeting uh, SMEs, uh, equity loans, um, uh, SMEs and innovation uh, within Horizon 2020, structural funds, and also the program for social change and innovation under, uh, for micro microfinance and micro enterprises. Just one practical point for everyone. We have just launched, if you Google uh, SME access to finance, or EU access to finance. Um, we have just launched a sing single access point uh, to get EU finance. This will be actually launched officially um, this week. Uh, there will be an informal competitiveness council. Uh, I would invite you to have a look at it uh, and give us uh, your comments as well. Basically, it creates um, one single entry point for SMEs to have a look at uh, what uh, um, different packages, financial packages um, exist for access to, fu to funding from the EU budget. Um, and if you get a map, there's a country and you have the information of who the interlocutors or the intermediaries are at the national level to offer information and support. Okay, thanks Joanna. And I was talking to Trina. Um, I think there was there was very little in what Joanna said that I, I would in any way disagree with and, and it was very practical. From my experience as an entrepreneur, I would say the comments about trying to get entrepreneurship into schools and universities are very valid. It's where people start to think in terms of thinking creatively outside the box. There are a lot of really good programs that I know of, particularly in Ireland, in terms of the Young Entrepreneur of the Year program and the move to try and get junior entrepreneurships into primary schools. Um, which is in, in, incredibly, it, it's incredible to see a 16 year old with a business plan who's already selling in HM and in fashion retail. It, it just inspires you on a daily basis to think that they're the generation who are coming up underneath you. Um, access to technology and funding are always going to be part of the things that we should strive for in terms of SMEs. And I would agree in terms of the red tape issues, which someone mentioned in terms of visas, it, it is, it's true. If we could do less of it, it would be very nice. Um, but o overall, it, it is really about partnerships and educating the people who are coming up from underneath us that are the points that I took from those questions. Uh, thanks, Trina. And now we turn to Richard Bruton, our Minister. Uh, well, thanks very much, Damien. Um, 
I suppose it's fashionable now to talk about ecosystems, uh, and I think it's very true that what you need is a, an ecosystem to support entrepreneurships. So it's, it starts at education and it goes right through the you know, research institutions and access to, to, to finance after that, the mentoring support. Uh, and what, what I find is that you know, while there's a lot of individual measures in place, um, one of the problems for a lot of SMEs is simply they don't have the management time to devote to the hunting and, and gathering that's required to find um, what the information is, what the programs are, who are the best mentors. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeking to do is to have, if you like, a first stop shop at local level where, you know, in a pretty easy environment, people can get access to what's out there. Um, our, our friend from Austria, I suppose, puts, uh, you know, this is the huge challenge. How do you sweat the investment in research that we have made and get more out of it. Um, in Ireland we've tried to reshape firstly the sort of research we fund so that we require a percentage, 30% of non-exchequer funding so that industry is actively there when the ideas are being conceived. We've tried to change the IP protocol so there is a fairly conventional established way in which any business can acquire a license or a patent whatever, to, 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 uh, to sort of standardise that process. And we've appointed now a central uh, technology transfer office. So there's going to be one central agent for all of our research institutions that effectively markets and sells. Whether this works, it's what we've done anyhow uh, in Ireland at the moment. So we're, we're trying to you know, be more focused in prioritising what we invest in to make it more commercial and to, to ease that channel. We've also attracted a lot of um, um, U.S. companies to set up innovation funds, which also mean that they would set up, say, like dog patch, so that they would have incubators attached to innovation funds. So we've tried to create a sort of an ecosystem where it's a little bit easier to do that. But the jury is out as to how successful this will be. But for a relatively small spend in Ireland, we seem to be doing comparatively well on a lot of the commercialization targets, but not stellar, but comparatively well, and we want to, to develop that. And I think it's the same throughout Europe. We all have the same uh, difficulties, and you have the, obviously the kickback from, from you know, the research community who want to see more blue sky research, and you know, we're trying to say, no, it, we need applied research. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a perennial debate, and I'm not sure that we, we have the balance exactly right. Um, what the EIB and those can do, I think, you know, to be fair, the 10 billion extra in, in capital will see, I'm sure, the EIB being innovative. They are today, in fact, you know, launching one of their low interest funds with one of our banks. Uh, they have supported our microfinance with a guarantee. Uh, so there is a good support, but I suppose in, 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 you, when the banks retreat to the extent to which they have retreated in many European countries, there is a big gulf, and maybe you know, we need to be thinking afresh about what's the shape of that. I think Ireland is relatively good, as Trina said, on the seed funding. You know, pretty, that start-up phase is pretty good in Ireland. The scaling is a different, uh, and maybe we're not so good when companies are growing to scale. Uh, and I think you know, we, we maybe would look to Europe to develop models that could be applied nationally, even if they're not, you know, even obviously if they're funded domestically. Okay, thanks, Richard. Um, we'll return to the floor for a few more questions. Uh, our, next our next speaker is from Sweden, uh, Mr. Matt uh, Odell. Odell. Thank you. Uh, also, thank you for three highly interesting and useful contributions. I have a few questions and comments to what Minister Bruton said. Um, and um, you mentioned uh, areas of opportunities, <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, we are fully aware of that these opportunities also are big challenges. You've mentioned yourself, uh, access to finance and so on. We had a hearing in the Swedish parliament, our committee on industry and trade, about the functioning of the inner market. And much to our, we were very surprised when we heard, for example, the representative of IKEA, a Swedish company you, you may have heard about, and they told us about the problems they have when they shall open new stores around in the European Union, in the inner market.